before I get started today, I'd like to thank Professor Sherman for inviting me to speak here today. And thank you all for uh, showing interest in listening to my story. What I thought I'd do today is share how I ended up here, a little bit about my background, and some details about my experience with brain cancer, then discuss how I coped with my illness by relating my experience to topics you are learning about in this class. When I get to how I coped, I'm going to cover, cover several areas, but hope to reveal that all can be reduced to one simple idea, that the best live message you can give yourself when faced with illness is to just keep getting back up. So how did I end up here? Last summer, I received UCSB Psychology Department's Inside Psychology newsletter. And in it, there was a section about Professor Sherman and his research in health psychology. I emailed him that, my, that his research findings were very similar to what I experienced in coping with my illness. And he graciously invited me to share my experience with you. When I told my wife, Cheryl, about the invitation, she said, wouldn't it be cool if it was one of the, in one of those huge auditoriums? <laughs> I suddenly had visions of myself in Campbell Hall and said, easy for you to say. You wouldn't have to be in front of a 1,000 people. Your brain isn't damaged. And most importantly, you still have all your hair. <laughs> I graduated from UCSB almost 20 years ago in 1988 with a degree in psychology. I lived in Anacapa dorm my freshman year and the last three years in Isla Vista. I also played various intramural sports, such as softball and football. After graduating, I moved back to Northern California, where I grew up, and worked in the market research field for a number of years. I got married in 1995, and, I, and, in, and in 1997, I earned my MBA degree, and ended up working at a Northern California hospital in the strategic planning department as a market and financial analyst. Then, in 1999, at the age of 33, only four years after being married, and only two years after getting my graduate degree, I was diagnosed with a highly aggressive form of brain tumor known as glioblastoma multiform, or GBM for short. It was a primary tumor, which just means that it originated in my brain and didn't metastasize from another place in my body. The tumor was located in the left frontal lobe and was quite large. The frontal lobe is responsible for such things as reasoning, planning, decision-making, judgment, and initiative, as well as mood, inhibition, behavior, personality, memory, and movement. Two days after ending up in, a, in the emergency room, I underwent brain surgery and had what is affectionately called a left frontal craniotomy. The surgeon worked for about five hours and was able to masterfully remove all of the tumor that he could see. When he was done, the piece of skull that was removed to access my brain was put back into place with titanium plates and screws, and my scalp was stitched closed. Two days later, I was wheeled to the curb and sent home. After a few long weeks of waiting, we finally received word that the tumor was cancerous. And this is what normal brain tissue looks like. And each, each purple spot is actually a nucleus of a cell. And these next two are from my tumor. You'll, you'll, you'll notice that not only are there many more cells, but they're also very oddly shaped. I told my oncologist to give me as much radiation as possible without killing me. For each treatment, I had to lie down. A custom-made mesh mask was placed over my face and head and secured to the table to keep my head from moving. And then they shot the radiation from three angles from the front left, the top left, and the back left. Since radiation to the brain can cause hair loss as the radiation enters and exits the head, I cut my hair very short in anticipation of it falling out. Around the third week of treatments, it started to happen. I remember one night when Cheryl and I were watching uh, television, my hair felt very brittle. I pulled some and it came right out. The next day when I washed my hair in the shower, I could feel hundreds of pieces slipping easily from my scalp. I watched them go right down the drain. Some, as you may be able to see, never grew back. I still keep it short because there are patches that never grew back from the radiation They're on the top here and in the back. If, if I let it grow out, it looks really silly. So <laughs> keep, 
keep it as short as I can. Around the fourth week, I started to get really tired to the point that when Cheryl left for work in the morning and came in to say goodbye, I could barely open my eyes to look at her. I said to myself, I guess the radiation is working. Since GBMs are so aggressive, my oncologist wanted to keep blasting away with more radiation. So a month or two after the standard six weeks of radiation, she scheduled what is called a gamma knife radio surgery procedure. The gamma knife involved mounting a metal frame to my head attached to my skull by four pins, two in the front of my head on either side of my forehead and two in the back directly behind the ones in front. The next slide is right after they took the metal frame off my head. You can see, hopefully, where the frame was attached to my skull in the front. I don't know why I'm smiling. It's <laughs> probably ha happy that think the treatment was over and probably also the medication, but. <laughs> All the treatments, the surgery, the six weeks of radiation, and the gamma knife were done within a four month period, ending a few days before Christmas of 1999. The treatments were very difficult, but were nothing compared to the many long term side effects that have resulted over the past eight years, such as seizures, bouts of scar tissue in my brain from all the radiation, brain swelling, debilitating fatigue, and cognitive deficits, not to mention the psychological and social adjustments that I've had to make. You see, the modern medical system is very good at assaulting you with what I like to call the big things, things like left frontal craniotomies and radiation and gamma knife procedures. Don't get me wrong, I'm eternally grateful for those things. Without them, I probably wouldn't be sitting in front of you here today. But, what, but while you're being dragged through the mud, while they're, busy, you, while they're busy pounding you with all the big things, and even long after they're done, it's up to you and your caregivers to find coping strategies to deal with what I like to call the little things. Things such as building teams of doctors, friends, family, neighbors, and coworkers, and teams of positive thoughts and healing images learning about nutrition for your body, mind, and spirit, dealing with the roller coaster of emotions such as denial, shock, fear, anger, relief, joy, sadness, loneliness, and triumph, dealing with insurance companies, learning the art and science of recovery, learning how to stay in the medical system, learning how to advocate for yourself when your, vo when your voice may be weak or non-existent, learning how to communicate with your doctors, your creator, and yourself, learning how to stick up for yourself when you are at your most vulnerable, when you have been beaten down by all the big things, balancing medications and dealing with medication side effects, exploring complementary and alternative medicines, finding support groups, relearning things you have forgotten how to do or have lost the ability to do, rebuilding relationships and reclaiming your life. And as you can see, many of these so-called little things really aren't so little at all. When Professor Sherman and I first corresponded, he was kind enough to send me some of his work in the field of health psychology. It was in those readings that I found the structure and terminology for the next part of my story, how I've coped with my illness. There are five areas within health psychology that have, inst have been instrumental in my coping strategy. They are social support, psychological control, self-affirmation, positive states of mind, and positive adjustment. Before I go into each area, I need to point out that when I was first diagnosed, I didn't just sit down and say, okay, now I need to develop a strategy to deal with this situation. Each stage of the illness has presented different challenges as well as different opportunities to meet those challenges. Each stage is a process of answering very practical questions such as, what's going to help me get through the next treatment? Or how am I ever going to go back to work? or even as simple as, do I have enough energy to make it up a flight of stairs, take a shower, or talk about my experience for 30 minutes? Sometimes it's a messy process. One day you can have a huge success, and the next day fall flat on your face. So for, coping, so for me, coping was and continues to be an active process. And it's only in retrospect that I have the luxury to sit back and see how my answers added up to an overall strategy to see that there was actually some method behind all the madness. The importance of social support is reflected in a conversation I had 
when I went back to work part-time after my treatments were over, I ran into, ran into the hospital chaplain, and she told me about the longtime surgeon who had recently come up to her and said that after all these years, he had finally figured out what helps patients recover faster from surgery. The chaplain asked about his discovery, and he, he explained that it was those with a good support system. Not only did I sense that that was something she had known for a long time, but it was also something I had just recently experienced for myself. From the beginning, I surrounded myself with what I called an outer healing team for support. The team obviously consisted of all the medical professionals that were in charge of my care, my neurosurgeon, neuro neurologist, neuro-oncologist, radiation oncologist, neuropsychologist, primary care physician and physician's assistant, as well as all the nurses, MRI technicians, counselors, and support group facilitators. I'm very lucky to have had compassionate doctors, those who have had the courage to treat me as a human being and not just another patient, or even worse, as just a disease or statistic. Cancer can be a very dehumanizing experience. As the focus becomes increasingly centered on getting rid of the disease, your identity as a person can get lost. But, you have, but, but if you have doctors that see you as a human being, that can laugh with you, that can cry with you, or just be there in the moment with you through the punishing assault of the treatments, it's much easier, easier for you to hold on to your identity. My team also included my wife, family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers who surrounded and supported me, doing such things as driving me to treatments, dealing with insurance companies, delivering meals, visiting, or just calling to see how I was. In a nutshell, I found that having a good support system helps to reduce not only the isolation of the cancer experience, but also the psychological and physical burden of the disease. But most of all, a good support system can help you find the strength to keep on going, to keep on getting back up. The influence of social support is so great that, in my mind, a bad support system can actually do more damage than a good support system can provide benefit. When you're diagnosed with cancer, there's a sense of being out of control. In the mad rush to set up treatments, find the best doctors, and to try and understand and accept the diagnosis, there is a need for some kind of psychological control, or what I like to call personal authority over the situation, and attempting to gain some was another part of my coping strategy. For example, I vividly remember laying in the emergency room after the doctor told us what they had found and agreeing with Cheryl that the best thing for both of us was just try and get through the surgery to get through the next couple of days, then deal with whatever presented itself. It was important for us in the beginning to try and not to look too far ahead, to take one small step at a time, otherwise it would simply be too overwhelming. Another way I gained some, some kind of psychological control was to limit the amount and type of information I was exposed to. I made sure my doctors knew what I did and did not want to know. I figured, why expose myself to information that would, at least in the beginning, limit my ability to gain some kind of personal authority over the situation? This was not denial. It was my way of protecting myself and minimizing the disease's control over me. I knew I had cancer, so it really didn't matter to me what stage or grade it was. I was going to attack it the same way physically and mentally with everything I had. Another way I gained some control was to have trust in my doctors and that I was receiving the very best possible care. For example, when the surgeon visited me the evening before the surgery, he told me there was a chance he could paralyze my right side if he got too close to the motor strip. I told him, be as aggressive as you want. I have 100% confidence and faith in you. There are a few other things that contributed to my sense of psychological control. When I was a sophomore here at UCSB, a close family member committed suicide. So I had a history of dealing with trauma and surviving a sudden life change. And since I had played sports for many years and had recovered from numerous injuries, including a few blows to the head, I trusted my body could recover from the surgery, radiation treatments, and long-term physical side effects. And finally, since I went to the emergency room and had my surgery in the hospital where I was working, I was in a familiar and comfortable environment. I was used to the sights, smells, and sounds of a hospital, 
and was surrounded and actually tended to by many coworkers. So psychological control gave me the resilience to keep getting back up mentally and fight my disease. Another part of my coping strategy has been to express myself through writing and through a process called self-affirmation. I've written stories for organizations such as the National Brain Tumor Foundation and the North American Brain Tumor Coalition, as well as having written a web-based book of my, about my experience called The Brain Tumor Diaries. I've also created a website called Brain Power Online, which has many links to brain tumor-related issues and resources. In these ways, I've been allowed to communicate and share my experience with other people whose lives have been affected by brain cancer and also, ho have, op have, and have also hopefully raised awareness of brain tumor disease among the gen general public. So at, a, so at a time when parts of my identity were being threatened, primarily my sense of physical well-being, but also over the course of time my responsibility as a husband and my role as a productive member of society, I focused on and affirmed other aspects of myself that I value, such as communication and education. This process of self-affirmation allowed me to find the strength and sense of self to keep getting back up. There's been another affirmation process at work. After all the trauma to my brain, I've somehow come away with a newfound talent for art. I'm now drawn to and can more readily recognize and create things that have a sense of wholeness and rhythm to them. It seems my brain has adapted on its own to the trauma, and I've been given a new and valued way of organizing, interpreting, and, and interacting with the world. If you'd like to see more uh, of my art, you can Google Scott Norris Art Studio, and the About Scott page also has links to Brain Power Online, as well as the Brain Tumor Diaries, if you want to read that. Another part of my coping strategy has been to try my best to maintain a positive state of mind. I did this in the beginning by focusing on the posit positives of the situation. The tumor was operable, the surgeon had removed all that he could see, and we had been very aggressive with, with the treatments. Also, I was, very, I was young and otherwise healthy, and we had used state-of-the-art technology for the surgery and the radiation. Another way I've maintained a positive state of mind is by refusing to be seen as a statistic. I've heard of other brain tumor patients who, from the very beginning, were told by their doctors they only had so many months or years to live, one even in the hospital right after his surgery. I've been fortunate to have never found myself in that situation, not only because I told my doctors I didn't want to focus on statistics, but also because I have doctors who believe in maintaining a sense of hope. As in the words of a neuropsychologist, every patient is a unique person in a unique environment. And if I did find myself being treated by a doctor who thought otherwise, I would simply fire him or her and keep on moving. I've really come to realize the importance of hope and how doctors can play a huge role in either inspiring or dashing hope in a patient. In the face of tremendous odds, sometimes hope is all a patient has to hold on to. And if that's taken away, they're left with literally nothing. I think part of the problem is that doctors and patients see hope differently. Whereas doctors tend to see hope as an either-or proposition, that is, either cure or no cure, either life or death, patients experience hope in a more flexible and adaptive way, sometimes coming in daily or monthly installments. It's obviously important that doctors are honest about the nature of disease and what they can and cannot affect, but they can do so in a manner that acknowledges the patient as a unique case, not as, a, not as a statistic. In doing so, a doctor not only leaves the patient's hope intact, but also makes the patient feel more secure in the face of threatening health information. So doctor-patient communication is very, very important. And not only does it become more and more important as the severity of illness increases, but it can also play a huge role in influ influencing a patient's ability to keep getting back up and facing their disease head on. Another way I've stayed positive was by creating a series of mental visualizations. I visualized many different things, ranging from how the tumor cells were reacting to the radiation 
to how I dealt with negative thought patterns. I would do visualizations during radiation treatments or at other times of the day to bring about and maintain a positive state of mind. Meditation is another way that's helped me to stay positive. I found that meditation provides a sense of peace and calm and is a great way to reduce stress. And I've heard that many hospitals are actually now recommending meditation for their patients. Finally, I'd like, to talk, I'd like to touch on the topic of adjustment. Over the past eight years, I've had to face many changes, not only physical, but psychological and social as well. The first few years were mainly focused on figuring out how to withstand and adjust to the physical. Aside from the surgery and treatments, I had MRIs scheduled every two to three months, as well as complications from the radiation, such as seizures, bouts of scar tissue in my brain, and brain swelling. But as the years went by and the time between MRIs increased, I get one every six months now, and many of the urgent complications have subsided, I've been able to focus on making longer-term positive adjustments in my life. I've been able to work with a neuropsychologist to develop strategies to, to deal with my physical and cognitive deficits, strategies that center on improving my quality of life at the same time understanding and, and respecting my limitations. I've also been able to reclaim my identity by reaching out to others and being reminded though, even though, that even though much of me has changed, I still possess the qualities that make me, me. Cheryl and I have been able to slowly shift from patient and caregiver back to husband and wife and are now finding different ways of doing many of the, of the things we enjoyed before I got sick. And through writing, I've been able to find meaning and value in my experience insight that will serve me well as I continue creating a new life for myself. One of the most difficult adjustments I've had to make and that I still struggle with to, to this day is at the social level. Much of the time I feel an awkward sense, as is described in one of Lance Armstrong's books, that I was pitched back into the world of the living after almost being killed by cancer. Part of the reason is that for me, much of my disability is invisible to others. If I'm walking down the street and have a hat on, people can't see my scar or patches of hair that have been lost to the radiation, nor can they see the, debil the, nor nor can they see the debilitating fatigue or cognitive deficits that I struggle with on a daily basis. For example, Cheryl and I once went to the hospital so I could get some blood drawn, and so, since I have a disability placard for my car, we parked in one of the spots right in front. A parking attendant asked me if we were picking up someone who's disabled. I told him I'm the one who's disabled. He proceeded to look at me up and down as if he didn't believe me, probably thinking I was just trying, par trying to park closer to the hospital. As we continued walking, Cheryl asked me if I was angry. I told her I wasn't and said that people just need to be educated. So no matter how successfully I feel I've coped with my illness on a personal level, there remains a social disconnect that I make that I find makes pitching myself back into the world a daunting task. Another part of this social disconnect is based on my ability to communicate and interact with the world around me. I address this aspect in the brain tumor diaries as follows. So after the dust had settled from all the damage caused by the tumor itself and the surgery, that is the left frontal craniotomy and the six weeks of radiation and the gamma knife, you remember all the pounding, all the big things that modern medicine is so good at, and the years and rise of fall, and the years of the rise and fall of scar tissue and some brain swelling. We had to determine to what degree, to what extent, the frontal lobe of my brain had been damaged. Not whether or if, mind you, but to what extent. So for that, a neuropsychologist was brought into the fold. A neuropsychologist is a licensed psychologist specializing in how the brain functions and the impact that brain damage has on one's abilities. So, after weeks of testing and talking with such a person, we came to find in a nutshell that sometimes, and this is my term, I disintegrate. Perhaps that sometimes should be many times. In a nutshell, what happens if I'm impacted by th such things, by things such as, again, these are my terms, duration, pressure, expectancy, intensity, complexity, multiplicity, overstimulation, decision-making, or speaking in front of large crowds, <laughs> 
et cetera, is that I disintegrate. And the speed of this disintegration process can get faster and faster as it moves along. It first begins, and this is a, in, a, in a very general cognitive sense, with a loss of complex comprehension. I start to have trouble understanding things, which is followed by a loss of language expression, both external when communicating with others, having trouble finding words, ideas, and concepts, and getting them from my brain to my mouth and out into the world, and internal when communicating with myself, that is, when I try to think. How can you not think? You just can't. Which is then followed by, and this is the kicker, the very center of, center of it all, in my mind at least, again my term, a loss of my subjective self, which means that sometimes, okay, many times, I lose the ability to integrate not only the environment around me, my sensory inputs, but also my inner environment. That is how I relate to myself, my emotions, my memories, and my talents, my desires, my hopes for the future. I lose the ability to relate to my environment, both external and internal, and make it my own. Sometimes, okay, many times, I lose my place in the world. I lose sense of how I am to go about living, functioning, and interacting with the world. I lose sense of how I go about being an active participant in my own life. Oh yeah, then this is followed by complete physical and mental exhaustion. So when I try to pitch myself back into the world, not only do I have to overcome misunderstandings based on how I appear, or rather based on how people think a disabled person should appear, but also based on my ability to communicate and interact with my environment. And that's why I spent so much time this past year deciding on the exact words that would best communicate my experience to you and why I decided to read the exact words that I wrote. Because by, because by this... <laughs> Because by this point in my talk, I should be close to the point of exhaustion. I'm glad, that I, added, I'm glad I added that sentence. <laughs> I spoke earlier about how each stage of my illness has presented different challenges, as well as different opportunities to meet those challenges. At this point in time, I can see one practical solution to this social challenge, and that is for me to just keep getting back up in front of people and sharing my story in the hopes of educating people about brain tumor disease and the difficulties that brain tumor patients face. As I look back, my coping strategy has allowed me to find hope in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds, to maintain faith in myself and those around me, to face my illness with courage, to be proactive in my care, to find value and meaning in my experience, and to deal positively with a very difficult situation. I've learned a lot coping with cancer, but I found that the best and simplest live message you can give yourself is to just keep getting back up. And the more positive things you can surround yourself to help you, physically, mentally, and spiritually, the easier it'll be. I feel the need to point out in closing that over the years, even though my body may have been weakened, there has been a large part of me that, to my delight, has been convalescing, that has been recuperating, that has been returning to health, that has been expanding, a part of me that has made, has made all the getting back up worth the effort. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>